Hello, and welcome to 3D Vision Technologies 10.4 Tech Talk, a monthly introduction to engineering technology that can make your company better, faster, and smarter. I'm Todd Majewski, your host for today. Today's topic is common uses for 3D printing in medical applications. Our guest speaker is Jeremy Marvin, application engineer for 3D printing. Jeremy works out of our Cincinnati, Ohio office and has been with 3D Vision for over five years. Good morning, Jeremy. Good morning, Todd. Thanks for having me. So, Jeremy, before we get started, I'd like to tell our listeners a little bit about you. So, before you came to 3D Vision, you worked in manufacturing and design for many years. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, so, you know, right out of school, and, you know, I started out as a co-op like a lot of engineers do these days. Uh, and, uh, and in the paper industry, we did some custom machinery, uh, some custom products for that market. And then I moved into a different company as a process engineer. Uh, still doing machine design, you know, very large, large, heavy industrial machines. And, you know, I spent, you know, time at the computer doing the design work. I spent time on the shop floor when issues arose, either doing assembly or during manufacturing. So uh, I've got, a, you know, 19 years under my belt on industrial uh, experience. So really a, a problem solver. No. Uh, I, I would think so, yes. Yeah, got it. <laughs> okay, so now that you've been with 3D Vision and you're on the 3D printing side of the business, tell me, what does an application engineer do? So as an application engineer, the, the big thing that I do is, you know, visiting customers with our sales team. So we've got sales uh, people in, in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. And uh, so right now I'm the, the sole 3D printing AE, and we visit customers, and, you know, everybody's excited about... 3D printing, they're excited about this, but how do we, how do they fit it in? And then, you know, how, how do we pay for it? So I'm looking for those issues, those problems, and then and maybe matching that with the solution that we might have. All right. So you're finding the right application in printing for a specific customer problem. Yep. And then as part of that, we'll, we'll do a proof of concept that we call benchmarks. We actually deliver a part to the customer so they can see it, and then they can compare that traditional versus a 3D printing. Yeah, so the old way to the new way. The old Got way it. to the new way, yes, sir. All right, well, sounds like that's going to be part of our topic today. So why don't you talk a little bit about the topic of this presentation? So we're going to see some uh, common uses, getting right into the presentation, we're going to see yeah. some common uses of 3D printing in the medical industry, specifically three key areas that we kind of focused on. Uh, number one is hospitals, seeing how doctors and surgeons and other members of their team are incorporating 3D printing into helping save patients' lives, improving the, the outcomes of surgeries. We're also going to be taking a look at design and manufacturing. Maybe it's a metal, medical device manufacturer, seeing how 3D printing is helping with prototyping, you know, improving time to market, and, and reducing costs. And then we'll, we'll close out with uh, orthotics and prosthetics. We'll see how uh, going back to that new way, old way, old way, new way uh, mentality is saying, you know, where, where we were at in history and seeing where that's going to end up uh, in the future. So most of your presentations are really examples of how the, in these three areas, I know that design and manufacturing has been using 3D printing, you know, uh, for a long time, but you're probably going to show us some new, uh, new exciting ways that they're using. Some new ways, exactly. Uh, and then before we get going, um, I do have a poll question for you. Um, all right, so do you, do you know somebody that's ever had a potentially life-threatening surgery? Now, either that's yourself or a loved one, you know, uh, like a grandfather or a close relative, so close friends. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of yeses on this one. You know, I mean, almost everyone knows somebody. Yeah, I was just thinking back to my, my, own, my own childhood. You know, I had, you know, grandfathers that were in the hospital a lot. As they age, it seems like you're there more and more and more. Sure. So let's take a look at our results on this. Yeah, just as we expected, a lot of people know someone who's been in surgery that could have been life-threatening. Now, now, we're not talking like shoulder surgery or knee or, you know, orthopedic type work. But this life, is life-threatening. Life-threatening. Yeah. And just a quick uh, uh, number for you. In, in North America, one out of six surgeries results in some sort of complication. Oh my gosh, you're kidding me. Uh, so yeah, on average, that more than doubles the cost of that surgery. So the complication doubles the cost. So if uh, and any life-threatening surgery is usually in that 50, 100,000, even sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars when you're dealing with life-threatening uh, surgery. So, yeah, so one out of six, keep that number in mind. That's amazing. 
All right, so focusing on hospitals for the time being, uh, kind of the old way, new way. Uh, so, you know, years, a couple decades ago, you know, when x-rays first came about, uh, we were talking about a, a flat two-dimensional image. All right, um, and doctors could look at that. They could kind of plan out. It was, it was an educated guess when they were planning for the surgery. Um, and, and it's almost like if you think about trying to solve a Rubik's Cube by looking at its image. It, it's very flat. There's not much you can do with it. Yeah, there's not a lot of problem solving looking at the 2D, right? Exactly. So step forward a few years and MRIs and CT scans come out. And we're still, we're still looking at a flat 2D image, but now we're looking at a stack of images. So we can actually go to a specific depth and look at the cross section. Yeah, it gives you a little bit more insight to what's going on. Yeah, yeah that's the so, way, new way. And that's traditional. I've had CT scans many times. Yeah. Yep. And so now we're able to take that same CAT scan data, that same CT scan data, and do uh, customer organs, customer part or, or uh, patient parts. And, and the models that we're printing is true to that, that patient. You know, nobody's built the same. Everybody's different. You can hold it in your hand. You move it around. You can solve that Rubik's Cube by, by looking at it from all the angles. So you're taking, now that we, you, you don't have to have a new scan, you're just taking the existing MRI, CT scans, and then stacking them together, making a 3D model. A 3D, almost like a CAD model. And then just printing it out. And, and just printing it out. So this allows, so having that, that model in your hands, it allows you to plan your approach. It allows you to look at it, to, to maybe get your, your team on board, uh, practice the procedure. We can actually print uh, in different uh, feelings, different textile feelings, tech, tactile feelings. So people that are using the surgical tools can try it out and feel it before they actually go in there. Uh, if I ever have my chest opened up for whatever reason, I, my doctor is going to have like 10 models in my heart before he goes in there. <laughs> All right. This will allow him to determine possible complications, you know, rule out certain treatments or certain ways of going about it and then to better communicate with this medical team and to educate the patients. Uh, in a study of reconstructive surgeries, the use of 3D models to plan or practice was re shown to reduce operating time by 18 percent. Wow. 18 percent. That's huge. Yeah, that's, that's... So there's hospitals using this now? Lots of hospitals. Okay. Uh, and we actually have a, cu a couple of stories about that. Uh, so this is regarding um, Mia, who was born with a congenital heart defect. And actually, uh, the name of her defect was so long, I couldn't fit it on the PowerPoint slide. Okay. Wow. So uh, her doctors, they said that she was inoperable. Uh, so whatever was wrong with her heart was eventually going to kill her unless they were able to fix it. So you know, that's news no parent ever wants to oh, hear. Oh, yeah. I, I've, got, I've got two little ones, and I would hate to hear this. Uh, so the doctor, you know, if you read the story, the doctor put that, that pro prognosis in his briefcase and he carried that with him. So every time he opened up his briefcase, he saw that until it came to him, you know, let's try 3D printing. So they, they printed out her heart from the CAT scan data uh, and planned the safest approach. They made a smaller incision and were able to produce or do the surgery in two hours shorter time period than it normally would have taken. And it accelerated her recovery, and, and she's alive today because of 3D printing. So what's that she has in her heart, or in her hand? <laughs> that is her heart. So That's that, the 3D model that the doctor used to save her uh, life. Save her life. Fantastic. Yep. And, and you guys that are interested, over on the side, we'll have a link to download the white paper on that. Feel free to grab that as they pop up. I think there's a video, too, on her. Is that correct? Or the, no? This one might have a video, but you might have to dig for it. Uh, if you search YouTube for Mia's Heart at Nicholas Children's Hospital, you'll find it. Right. Okay. Uh, and then we'll try to make it on our webpage available to you guys. All right, got it. Uh, all right. So uh, another story. Uh, you know, a little older person is, is Teresa, and uh, she had an aneurysm. Um, and, and in this case, they held the aneurysm, and she's got it in her hand. They held it in her hand. They actually did the procedure on it several times, trying to find that best way to determine the, out, the potential complications. And again, an inoperable person becomes operable. Well, you know, this is definitely an old way, new way of doing surgery. I mean, this is phenomenal because now hospitals have the ability to actually look at a patient's problem in their hand and uh, come up with uh, basically guides and assistance
to figure out what's the best course of action. Right. And, and in this case, this, this hospital, and you had asked about hospitals already printing, these people have been doing it for four years. And what they've learned, the best thing that, you, that they're getting out of this is that how not to do a surgery. Wow. So they'll, they'll try it out several times and they'll learn, well, I can't do it this way. I can't do it this way. Oh, this is the way that works. This is the way it's going to save their life. Wow. Okay. And we have another poll coming up pretty quickly. Um, so just a quick guess. So we've talked about 3D printing is already in the medical industry. People are already using it. Uh, and your best guess, and this is just a guess, we're not going to hold you accountable to it, is how much has this grown in the last year, you know, 2015 to 2016, you know, 2017 data is not out yet. So in, in the year 2015 to 2016. So I'm, I'm not expecting our audience to know, but I'm thinking this is going to be their opinion, how much has this grown in hospitals, right? That's hospitals, really, yep. yep. Medical models only, how much has it grown? You know, so let's take a look at the results on this one, and it looks like... Everyone's best guess, yeah. They're thinking so, it's probably growing 50 to 100%. What's so, the answer? Well, I want to tell you my guess. My guess when I heard this, this number was 88. I said, all right, 88%. Yeah. So, um, and actually, it, it's the bottom, over 100%. And, and truthfully, it's 306% growth in wow. that one-year time period. So hospitals are recognizing the need to do this to help reduce costs. Right? Uh, yeah. And save lives. Saving lives is a big deal. Wow. Those are great examples of how hospitals are using 3D printing, which is the old way, now new way. Yep. yep. All right, so another uh, section, so we talked about hospitals. This is traditional manufacturing. So taking a look at, if you think about a doctor or a surgeon, and they're very particular on how the, the device feels in their hand, uh, or ergonomics, we'll call that. All right. So they would outsource probably this design, like give me, give me a bunch of models where I can test and feel how I like it, you know, you don't want an, a, a surgeon cramping up in a surgery at the last, the last 11th hour, you know, we, we got to make it all that 12 hours of that surgery. So they'll go through several iterations, they'll, they'll choose a couple that they like, and they'll do several prototypes of that. And, you know, once they got the feel for it, it's going to work right, it's going to function right, then they'll actually cut uh, steel tooling and then mass produce it. It actually takes about eight years for a medical device to get to market at the cost of tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to go through clinical trials, to go through government approvals, and if you get to the end and you don't get that approval or something goes wrong, that money's gone. Wow. So you better get it right. Yeah. The importance of having the design right early is critical. Sure. And this is where 3D printing can really help out. So this is Walla Long University. I, I believe they're in China, and they were producing and actually, let's look at a poll first. Uh, so when designing or when investing in your, your processes, what, what's your biggest concerns? When you're investing, what are your biggest concerns to, to spend money on your processes? Uh, whether it's reducing costs. You know, everybody wants to do their, their job in less money, with less money. Maybe increase time to market. Yeah, I would expect time to market is going to be important, but yeah. man, to me, they, they, they all are important, but I'm wondering which one might be the most important. Yeah, maybe several design iterations. All right, so looking at the answer, um, uh, the all of the above was kind of the clear winner, yeah. clear winner, but design iterations and confidentiality are, are right there, uh, you know, as half, half of it is design iterations and confidentiality, and maybe... Maybe design iterations is, uh, you know, as you're doing a new product, maybe you're not redesigning every part. Maybe you're doing just a couple of those major components, but more iterations give you the ability to do more more of it. Yeah, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, Jeremy, and I know that a lot of customers that have been buying our 3D printing technology want to keep it confidential, and they don't, you know, they outsource a lot of, of tasks, and keeping it in-house is very important. Okay, so getting back to Wollongong University in China, uh, they they are producing uh, medical model or actually medical tooling for medical device manufacturers and biocompatible materials. So what they found by incorporating 3D printing uh, that they can reduce the cost of that, like fixturing, we'll say, by 30 to 50 percent, and they're able to do it 90 percent faster. So take that two-week delivery down to a one-day delivery. 
I see the bullet of design freedom. Can you expand on that? What do you mean by design freedom? Design freedom is not being bound by design for manufacturing. So we had to allow areas for uh, for machine tooling heads and bits to get to. And uh, maybe we had to separate certain areas to make it even machinable. All right, we don't have that limitation with 3D printing. We can print anything. All right, we can't manufacture everything. Got it. Okay. All right, so we have di digital inventory. Uh, so we're not mass producing the part. We're not putting it on the shelf and using it. We're revising, we're replacing, and replicating that as needed. Got it. So you're building it as you need it versus making 100 and then inventorying yeah. it. Just in time is making its way to medical. Old way, new way. Got it. Okay. So uh, this story is about diversi div uh, diversified plastics. They are a contract tool maker, so they, they specialize in uh, injection molding. Uh, and specifically, their biggest client base is in the medical device industry. So if they had a customer come to them and say, I need a prototype of my part, they would cut a mold out of aluminum or a very inexpensive tool steel. So that, the turnaround time on that's about five weeks and at their cost about $13,000. Right? So once they incorporated 3D printing, that took uh, they realized a cost savings of 88% and a time savings of about 80%. Wow, that's incredible. So they are making short run tooling because, or is this can do lots of parts, small amount of parts? No, uh, either short run or uh, their their big story was the the prototype. You know, they couldn't get a prototype cheaply or very inexpensively. It, it was always a long lead time, and it was always very expensive for just a handful of parts. Have uh, one more customer story in this section, and this is about Assist Medical. All right, so in their case, they had uh, they needed a cost-effective way to manufacture for either clinical trials or pilot commercial production. Now, looking over at this little uh, device over here on the side, uh, the housing around the screen is actually 3D printed in the end product. So they didn't need a large quantity; they just needed the couple dozen that they needed to get out in the field. All right, so that is, that's there. It eliminated so much tooling. We talked about the molds costing tens of thousands of dollars. The mold to make that's pretty insane. You know, that limited all that tooling. Um, and then people could see, you know, going from prototype to final production much quicker, producing organic shapes, complex geometry, and, you know, the design freedom. We don't have to have draft anymore. We don't have to, to uh, have the certain wall thicknesses just to allow it to, to inject correctly. Right, and then the shrinkage and all the things that come with that. Yeah. So the ability to produce the part any way we want without having those limitations, or maybe it can't be manufactured any other way. So do you help your customers with that type of, you know, how to design for 3D printing? We, we touch on it. So we have a class that we teach called Insight, so the software that runs 3D printers, and we go over a lot of tips and tricks. And, and if a customer called me up and said, Jeremy, I want to reduce my time on this, or I need, to, I need it quicker, how can I do that? There's a few tricks we can do, and I'll, I'll definitely help out a customer in need. Great. Thank you. Okay. So it's, All right. Do we have a, a poll? Okay. All right. So it's not just uh, manufacturing uh, devices and, and medical devices. We also have, you know, think about orthotics and prosthetics. Um, you know, we mentioned this is one of our key areas we're going to focus on. So, again, a new way, an old way, new way. And I went out to the Internet and I found this image, and it, was, it just blew my mind that they did this back in the 1900s. And it's actually, you know, old iron. So think about a blacksmith hammering away at this. You know, once the bottom of the foot was done, they would, you know, it looks like they used spikes to hold it into a wooden base. Maybe they wrapped this, you know, get some really extreme comfort and wrap it in leather and maybe put, uh, I don't know, but it, it didn't look very comfortable. The bottom doesn't flex. It's very rigid. The guy probably walked with the limp. I'm sure that was high tech back then. Uh, very high tech. Anything, anything a blacksmith did was probably the height of technology. Uh, so you know, fast forward a couple decades, and today that uh, the partial limb was coated in you know plaster of Paris, and we had to create a mold. So it's custom fit, sort of. You know, if it was an injury, we had to wait you know a few weeks, five six weeks for the swelling to even go down. So you're you're sitting until that happens. You're going in, the, the stuff is, the plaster of Paris, is, it gets hot when it sets. It's uncomfortable, probably itchy. 
uh, and then they wrap it up, you wait for it to cure, and then they send it off to where they manufacture it. Um, I mean, basically they're taking their standard knee down and, and, and making it match up to, to the partial limb that's left. Right? So that traditional method with using the plaster Paris uh, can cost upwards of about $40,000. Right. So let's bring 3D printing. So, you know, we talked about design freedom, being able to design, maybe not for, we can always have the function, but making it look good, making it look artistic, uh, improving that fit, form, and function. You know, we're not, we're not going to use the plaster of Paris anymore. We're going to take a 3D scan, a 3D image, get that exact detail down to the thou, you know, down to thousands of an inch, the accuracy that we can see. So if there's any imperfection, it's picked up right away. It's picked up. It's going to fit perfectly. I mean, better than a glove. Uh, we're going to eliminate material inside or outside, maybe for uh, non-stress areas. You know, the more material we re re reduce, we're reducing weight. We're reducing the cost. Uh, we can vary the thickness for comfort. We can put the strengths where it needs to go. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at that orthotic that looks like the one, uh, something similar to my father has because he's, uh, he's had hip surgery and he lost the ability to lift his uh, feet, his toes, so he's got what's called a drop foot. And he has to wear one of those, but it doesn't look anything like that. It's certainly not custom, and he can only wear it certain times of the day. It's very uncomfortable. He can't get his shoes on really well. So there's a lot of problems with the, the standard or old way of products being uh, being used out there today. So he's watching TV and he wants to get up to get a, a Coke. He's got to put on this device to walk. Or he has to walk very carefully not to trip, right? Because that's what it's it's eliminating is the ability to uh, you know, stub your toe, stub your foot on the carpet or the floor. Gotcha. We could actually incorporate a little toe stubbing device. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. <laughs> All right, so uh, our first story in the prosthetics and orthotics is Emma. And uh, if you guys need a good cry, grab your Kleenexes because this is, this is a heart-wrenching story. Um, so the, her, she was born with uh, AMC. I'm not going to try to pronounce that one. I actually was able to get that one to fit on the slide. And the, this, this disease was causing a very, very high amount of stiff joints. Which, which prevented her muscles from fully developing. So she couldn't lift her arm, she couldn't move, she couldn't lift her head. She was in surgery or in casts for you know, the first two years of her life. Wow. So her parents went to a medical show, they, they saw a device for adults, but they didn't make one for kids, so they approached a hospital. Oh, you mean an exo, exoskeleton? Yeah, the exoskeleton or the device, the medical device that she has. And we want to do this for our daughter. So nobody did it because you couldn't, you couldn't plan for, or you couldn't, it needed to grow with the kids. So they had to really think about the design and how to make this work. How can I shrink down those devices and make it growable and, and almost, uh, you know, piece parts like Legos. So you can put it together when they need to. And when the part breaks, they can break it. So they printed it. Uh, and now, you know, this lets her play. She can move her body. Um, we have a little white paper that will be available for you guys. There will be uh, a link to a video somewhere in there. But... Watch your story. It's it's an awesome story. That's uh, incredible. Yeah. Well, give me that Kleenex, by the way. Okay. All right. So our last story of the day is Alex. So Alex was born with uh, just a part, of, uh, just a portion of his right arm, uh, and he received a first three D printed prosthetic in twenty fourteen. And it was it was early. I mean, twenty fourteen. That's three years ago. That's that's pretty early on. So. Uh, as time progressed and he needed a new one, the, the company Limitless Solutions created a new one for him. And they, they, if you look at it there in the picture, you can kind of see it. It's a little bit like Iron Man. And uh, Robert Downey Jr. showed up in costume, in character as Tony Stark, you know, this guy's hero, uh, to deliver this hand uh, and turned out really well for him. So he, as far as I know, he's still wearing it. Um, but that, that new 3D printed prosthetic is... Saving, you know, as far as savings goes, 99.5% saved based a traditionally made prosthetic. Wow, that's huge. So because it's 3D printed parts and all the parts are lower cost and uh, compared to an uh, original. I'm sure compared to Tony Stark's arm, it's a, a lot cheaper, but uh, <laughs> that's amazing savings. Yep. So they, that company actually open sourced the design. So if you know somebody that needs one, you can go print one. Uh, you can donate one if you wanted to. Wow. That's a, I'd love to hear that uh, more of that story. Uh, I'm going to check out that website.
Sure. And that's limitlesssolutions.org. All right. So just some, some conclusions to, to take away from our, our presentation. Um, so hospitals are using 3D printing today and have been doing it for a couple of years to improve patient outcomes, saving people's lives. They're holding that heart, holding, you know, whatever organ, you know, true to the customer, true to the patient, that actual patient's uh, anatomy. We're, we saw how uh, device manufacturers are in, in speed, you know, improving speed to market, improving quality, and reducing that tooling cost. And then uh, the last thing we touched on was the uh, orthopedic and uh, prosthetic, orthotics and prosthetics, and how the development of that is being re revolutionized with 3D printing. You know, there's a lot of different areas. Why don't we jump into um, our Q&A session and let's see if we've got some questions that we can kind of cover for our customers. Uh, looks like there's a question coming in and it says, um, do you have any metal parts? That's a great question, you know, and uh, what I think we want to do is maybe tell our audience that we, you did a presentation, how to build metal parts without a metal printer. Yep. And when was that? About maybe six months ago. So what we should do is send a link to that client and uh, show them uh, the, the video and they could watch the a tech talk we did on how to, make, how to make metal parts without a metal printer using a plastic printer and then doing some other processes to make a metal part. So that might be good for him. Um, here's a second question. I can't afford it, uh, a 3D printer. Um, how can I help my patients? Maybe you can take that one, Jeremy. So um, if I had to have this, if I was very passionate about printing and I couldn't pay for the printer, I would probably outsource the, the building of those parts to service bureaus. You know, as long as I had the, the CAT scan, the MRI data, I could send that off and I could have it printed. Uh, and we have a couple of local service providers that could do that, uh, us included in that. We could, we could help you build that ROI. Right, so if you, I guess if you can't afford the printer, yeah, you certainly could just have a part built, which is a very easy um, methodology. <laughs> All right, let's see if we have any other questions here. And I think that's, we hit all of them. That sounds good. Okay, well, you know what? Thank you for the, th the 30 minutes, uh, audience. And Jeremy, I thank you for all the information. Some of those stories were fantastic. Um, I want to tell everyone that's listening that um, we are recording this session and we'll send you an image or a link to the video. And I want to make sure everyone uh, knows that. Also, if you want to share that with colleagues and friends, feel free to do that. Thank you again, everyone, for coming. I appreciate your time. And don't forget to come join us next month at our 10 for Tech Talk, where we're going to talk about SolidWorks World 2017 recap. I appreciate it, Jeremy. Thank you for your time. And goodbye, everyone, and have a productive day.